So I would just start off by recognizing that we're um, delivering this um, symposium on uh, unceded territory of the Musqueam. And we really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's really my honor and pleasure to introduce um, uh, a CBR member, PI, um, Dr. Andrew C, who's uh, located away. Where are you? Are you at VGH right now? I'm actually at the Provincial Blood Coordinating Office right now. I'm just checking that he's not at home or on a, on a beach somewhere. Um, so Andrew um, was trained, uh, did his undergraduate training at the University of Saskatchewan, um, did his medical training there. Um, um, and you'll tell me when I get this wrong, um, but then has moved across the country here, hither and thither, um, went to um, uh, University of Western Ontario or the Western University um, to do his um, intern, internal medicine there. And then I migrated to McMaster, which is in Hamilton, Ontario, for those not familiar, um, to do his um, 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 hematology uh, training and transfusion medicine training um, at a well, certainly a well-recognized institution for hematology um, and thrombosis and hemostasis and transfusion medicine in general, um, and did a health research met methodology program there. He was a, a clinical investigator in the clinical investigator program along the way. <clears throat> so um, well-trained um, and always, always enthusiastic, and we were thrilled, everybody was thrilled, to recruit him even further west than his um, roots um, to um, British Columbia, where he joined the University of British Columbia as an assistant professor and rapidly rose through the ranks to associate professor um, in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. And we recognized an opportunity and recruited him to the Center for Blood Research as an investigator as well. He's an adjunct scientist. <clears throat> with the Canadian Blood Services. Um, and then he holds a multitude of director positions. And I can't start to number them, but they are mostly transfusion related at the VGH, at, um, um, at the uh, uh, Vancouver General Hospital, at the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. As the medical director of transfusion medicine, there are various titles to those um, positions, but clearly a, um, a well, well suited for his expertise and knowledge. He's a co-director of the BC Provincial Blood Coordinating Office, um, which is what one of the major topics that he's going to discuss um, today. He, as I mentioned, a, a very enthusiastic, talented, um, young Young, I'll still call you young investigator. I can say that from my pr perspective. Well published, a superb teacher um, and mentor of uh, students and a terrific collaborator. <clears throat> so I'm thrilled to um, um, have him here, so to speak, um, to talk today at our seminar series. Mm -hmm. So Andrew, you're on stage. All right, just confirming for folks in the room, can you hear me? Awesome. Okay, well, uh, thank you for the kind words, Ed. And again, you know, it's it's also great to be a, a group for the as part of the Center for Blood Research because I think for most of you will recognize, um, you know, I'm not a lab research a lab <laughs> researcher per se, but more having a bit more of a clinical and a bit of more of a pol uh, policy focus. So that's largely what I'm here to talk about today is is my role within the BC Provincial Blood Coordinating Office and to maybe talk about some of the policy and some of the initiatives that we're working on and maybe even why a provincial blood coordinating office exists and some of the background behind it. Um, again, as as Ed pointed out, you know, uh, I wa wanted to acknowledge the fact that we're uh, delivering this or I'm delivering this also on the uh, unceded territory of the Coast uh, Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish and Sailwood Tooth Nations and would ask uh, for everybody who's sort of calling in uh, remotely just to consider the, the territory that you live in and uh, the Indigenous history that that exists there. I do have personal disclosures, but I won't be discussing anything off label in this uh, talk, but uh, just want to do this here for transparency. And then also I'll say that as a personal caveat that um, I can't take credit for decades of work that have been done. So my role within the Provincial Blood Corning Office started about eight months ago. So the work discussed here really represents a lot of work that has come before me. And I'd also like to uh, especially thank Dr. Doug Morrison for the type, the idea of the title and the guidance. So old dog, new tricks, uh, sort of thinking about the new things we can do within PBCO and to Amy Beauchamp for the use of some of our historical slides in the history. Um, would also just to say with my roles at Vancouver Colstow and, and PHSA through PBCO that uh, the opinions expressed in this presentation are my own and, and don't necessarily represent any organization I'm affiliated with. Okay. 
So just as a brief outline for what I'm going to discuss today is maybe to even kind of set the stage for why even a coordinating office should exist. And with that, we can get into a little bit of the Kreber Commission and the the blood stand, uh, scandal and the, um, the, the idea that of, of needing provincial stewardship um, in, in the blood system. And then to get into a little bit of the history of the PDCO and a lot of uh, discussion that has happened to the PDCO is how do we build on our current initiatives and what are the future challenges that we have to, uh, to implement? So that's around utilization management, uh, clinical practice and continuous quality improvement. So first of all, I think maybe it's useful to set the stage for even why transfusion medicine exists as a, as a style of practice. So uh, my personal belief is that transfusion medicine, its main mandate as a field is really to ensure safety and appropriateness from vein to vein. So that really encompasses when we get collect blood from donors, when it hits the hospital and it goes all the way into the patient. I think our role within transfusion medicine is to ensure all those areas are safe um, and and the, the blood is well used. And because of that, I think transfusion medicine is quite, a, uh, quite unique in its practice compared to many clinical disciplines of medicine or even lab disciplines of medicine that to say this is really a process driven approach. So, you know, rather uh, in addition to being concerned about individual cases, you know, such as managing transfusion reactions, as an example, we also, uh, I think the purview of transfusion medicine physicians is to look at the processes that occur within the blood system and within hospitals to make sure that, uh, again, blood is being transfused safely and appropriately. Um, and I, I, I think it's a, it's a pretty unique style of practice that really lends itself to, to projects and initiatives. And this is to also say that blood, even though in, in many jurisdictions, uh, transfusion medicine is both seen as a clinical discipline and also a lab discipline. Um, and I think it's because it's uniquely seen as both a diagnostic and a therapeutic. And therefore, uh, because it has so much crossover, it crosses into a lot of folks who practice transfusion medicine, such as um, folks on the nursing side, on the lab side, um, and then also a wide variety of uh, clinical specialties as well, ranging from hematopathology to hematology. And more and more, we're starting to see uh, clinical pathologists and anesthesiologists being involved as well. In addition, as you can imagine, uh, blood is a ubiquitous therapy used in a lot of different um, uh, clinical specialties. So we oftentimes have a lot of interplay with uh, emergency and critical care, hematology, neonatal and pediatrics, uh, OBSGYNE, transplantation services, just to name a few. So I think, again, one of the unique aspects of, of what we do in transfusion medicine is we actually happen to touch um, and support uh, a lot of different uh, clinical specialties out there. And this sort of takes us maybe, uh, as many of you know, of the history of the tainted blood scandal or, or what led to the Kriever inquiry of the Kriever Commission. Um, the tainted blood scandal was largely considered Canada's worst preventable uh, public health crisis and in short led to over you know, 30,000 infections. And in 1993 in the House of Commons, there was a public inquiry to sort of review and restore confidence in the blood system, which um, you know, again, led to the Kriever inquiry. This led to a need for national blood policy to ensure safety and became the basis for Health Canada standards for which blood banks get regulated uh, by Health Canada through inspections. Also in most jurisdictions, you also have local accrediting bodies that also ensure that blood banks are appropriating to an uh, appropriate standard as well as the stakeholders that they engage with. And one of the other things that was recognized with the Kriever Commission was that uh, the blood system needed to be at arm's length from the federal government uh, just to make sure that, um, you know, that decisions made were, were independent and in the, in the both donor and patient interests. Sorry. Um, the other thing also to call out is that blood is an expensive therapy in general, uh, which is something that's oftentimes not, uh, not always um, uh, called out in the public health care system. So here uh, is the most recent data demonstrating that we've gone from a, a, just a component and product uh, budget all the way up to 195 million uh, within this province alone. And most of that is encompassed by red blood cells, uh, immune globulin and factor products, which represent about 83% of our, our blood budget cost. But also we're starting to see increasing um, utilization and thus cost with other types of products that are not necessarily well-regulated either. Uh, so this is to say that 
even though many hospitals or health jurisdictions don't see this cost, it's important for us to be stewards of the system because eventually it all comes out of the same healthcare budget and the same tax uh, from the same taxpayers. And oftentimes, appropriately, uh, we also have a history of um, benchmarking ourselves in British Columbia to the rest of the country and also to comparable provinces. And this is to say, I think we've done a very good job in British Columbia, but obviously, um, you know, we're all tightly tied together in the blood system. So oftentimes we'll look to each other for um, inspiration in regards to improving, let's just say, appropriate IVIG utilization or appropriate red blood cell utilization. So I think you know, one of the uh, interesting aspects of the blood system is that really, um, because it's funded separately compared to PharmaCare, uh, the way PharmaCare is uh, funded in hospitals and outside of the hospital, as well as hospital budgets and out of hospital care having separate budgets, um, there is a unique dynamic in the blood system where most of the stakeholder or many of the stakeholders in the blood system don't actually see the cost that's attributed to the blood system. And I think um, it is one of our continuing challenges within the blood system in Canada of how to sort of connect to the rest of the stakeholders in the blood system and the rest of healthcare to recognize that we really need to holistically rationalize better care in the public healthcare system. So we're using our healthcare dollars wisely. And that takes us to the origins of the PBCO. So this was originally established in 1997 as an advisory body to, of the Ministry of Health that occurred again after the Creeper Commission. And this originally resided under Providence Healthcare. Most of you will know that as St. Paul's Hospital under its founder, Dr. David Pai, who um, I had the pleasure of, of knowing um, during my first uh, formative years here in Vancouver. When the PBCO was formed, um, it was eventually aligned with the Provincial Health Services Authority in 2007. And through a variety of different sort of um, changes in governance, uh, largely now exists as within the provincial laboratory medicine services in the provincial health services authority. So really brought from sort of a jurisdictional program to sort of a, a provincial program. And it's mandate is really to, again, in, similar to the mandate of transfusion medicine as a field, is to promote and facilitate the delivery of safe, appropriate, standardized, and sustainable use of blood and blood products, as well as their alternatives throughout BC. And I think alternatives is something that doesn't oftentimes get enough um, airplay uh, in, the, in, in the blood system, because oftentimes, again, even though blood's uh, 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 potentially easy to access in some instances, their alternatives may actually be better for patient care. In addition, the PBCO manages, leads, and develops projects uh, and programs aimed at this, uh, aimed as at the mandate above. And also, because we have so many stakeholders to engage for those who uh, both use blood and manage blood, uh, uh, our role is to engage valuable resource groups and specialists to support um, the insight, guidance, and expertise uh, to support, again, our role with the Ministry of Health, as well as our provincial stakeholders and agencies. And we, this is not to say that we think at the PBCO, we're at the center of the universe, but we think we actually have a, an ability to be sort of the connective tissue between different bodies within, the, within British Columbia, whether it's through the Ministry of Health, uh, the Provincial Lab Medicine Services, and also the Health Authority for Clinical Transfusion Practice. Um, uh, to say that I think our goals align with many of the goals that are established in each of these um, uh, of the overall system goals of these each of these organizations. Uh, so again, we play a role in sort of connecting these folks together um, to uh, achieve these uh, achieve each of their individual mandates. And finally, uh, with the blood system in Canada, we also tend to be very tightly tied within Canada as well. So. Uh, um, the PBCO in British Columbia does not exist by itself, but actually exists within a network of national collaboratives. So we have other blood coordinating offices that exist all throughout the country. We have a na two da different national blood suppliers and Canadian Blood Services in Hemo Quebec. We work with the Public Health Agency of Canada for um, hemovigilance. And then also there's the National Advisory Committee on Blood and Blood Products, which sort of, uh, you know, takes representatives from every uh, province and territory uh, to connect them together in terms of best practice. So we we tend to know our collaborators in throughout Canada very well uh, to try to make sure we have a harmonized system because the blood budget is also uh, is also national, funded by each of the provinces and territories. 
So this is to um, maybe outline, broadly speaking, if I if I could go over every single one of the things that PBCO have done in the past, I would be much here much longer than an hour. But I think I really wanted to sort of go through some of the current PBCO goals and objectives that relate to what has happened in the past and how we hope to build upon in the future. And as I've mentioned, one thing um, you know, with, in terms of provincial stewardship and also. Um, having appropriate use of blood where the alternatives may actually be better for the patient. Um, some of our highest priority is around utilization management, where we, we're focusing a lot on our immune globulin utilization management, as well as our work with the Inherited Bleeding Disorders Clinic. So for many of you who, uh, many of you will probably know this in the audience already, but immune globulin um, is something that's taken from Pool donated human blood plasma. So it's actually seen as a blood product in Canada, although in other jurisdictions, it's seen as a pharmaceutical product. And it is oftentimes given from, from a clinical perspective as both an immune replacement therapy, that is if someone doesn't have enough immune globulins uh, based off of their underlying disease, uh, this is used to replace uh, their immune system. It's also used as an immunomodulator, uh, which is to say if people have uh, a, a deranged and deranged immune uh, response that is causing pathology, uh, people give, uh, clinicians will give Ig to try to correct that. It is interesting where for immune replacement, there's not much in the way of alternatives, but alternatives exist, do exist for immunomodulation, where uh, Ig usage, some off-label usage does occur, where it's a little bit unclear in efficacy, and oftentimes is used because of access issues of alternatives that are oftentimes pharmaceutical in nature. And Ig use is actually increasing over time. And this is a common theme that you'll see throughout Canada and actually many parts of the world as well. And increasing utilization in itself is not a bad thing, but one of the things is uh, one of the aspects that we want to confer within the blood system is that its use is appropriate and it's leading to good return on investment in terms of outcomes. And that's important because Ig has this uh, for Canada actually has the second highest per capita uh, of, of Ig use worldwide. And if we were to look at this as a drug, it'd actually be the third most costly drug in uh, nearly all provinces. So again, useful to think about whether or not we're using this appropriately and whether or not we're having appropriate return on investment. In addition, as I mentioned before, um, because it's donated from pooled human plasma, we are oftentimes competing with other jurisdictions around the world in terms of access to source plasma and Ig. And um, there has been uh, previous bowel supply challenges that have occurred in the past. And this has become enough of a concern where some jurisdictions such as the United States have announced uh, issues with shortages in the past and we've actually had a national meeting to discuss IVIG shortages that occurred in early 2021. There is a current national IG shortages plan being created. There was interim guidance that's released in, um, that was released during the pandemic. But for the current national IG shortages plan, this was seen as enough of a priority that is um, both led by NAC, but also funded by Health Canada, because they recognize that um, if you don't have enough immune globulin for patients that especially that need it without a suitable alternative, then that could uh, lead to um, deleterious effects for patients. So this is maybe an oversimplification, but in many uh, instances where Ig is stewarded by the blood bank, um, I would say some of the flaws that I've observed or that have been observed in, in many blood banks is that oftentimes a blood bank receives a request for or a prescription for immune globulin by a clinician. And it is adjudicated um, by a typically provincial or local guidelines as either appropriate or inappropriate or, or so-called off-label. And there are some off, many off-label uses that are very appropriate, uh, which is why they appear in guidelines. After that uh, adjudication occurs, if it's appropriate, it's typically approved and dispensed, but sometimes there's not necessarily a way to, um, uh, to confirm the diagnosis before it is dispensed. And then also, if the adjudication occurs where it's off-label and also inappropriate, there's often enough times a back and forth between the transfusion service and the clinical teams regarding appropriateness, where oftentimes there's not a, a, a great incentive nor mechanism to, to actually uh, uh, suggest that the, the product should not be released or there should be an alternative that should be sought. I think, in, and this work was 
occurred long before my time. But I think one of the great things that British Columbia has done, and part of its secret sauce in terms of uh, managing utilizing utilizing um, IG appropriately, is first of all, is a couple things that I've uh, highlighted in blue here. So the great thing is that, first of all, the guidelines are co-developed um, with clinician input in mind um, to agree on the appropriate utilization of IG. And then after it's dispensed, because there's a utilization management coordinator in every single health authority, not only is it approved and dispensed, but it's also done so with further recommendations around dose adjustment, uh, frequency, uh, these sorts of aspects. And then with that, um, in many instances, in some of our conditions, we also collect outcomes as well, which further inform our inventory management practices or our utilization management practices, as well as our guidelines. If it's off-label and potentially inappropriate, uh, we also in British Columbia have a pathway to have selected referral to expert specialist panels. So in British Columbia, there are specific neurology panels and rheumatology panels that can co-manage these patients with outcome collection to try to connect um, in the, these patients to the best specialty care possible. And th this is to say that all the uh, utilization management um, initiatives that have occurred over time have been a steady, um, it, it have, have occurred through steady iterations where we started initially with a clinical guideline and handbook, uh, eventually leading to a centralized screening process, leading to the different panels being set up for rheumatology and neurology. Um, uh, immunologists were then subsequently uh, brought in. And then there was an overall uh, plasma protein product strategic plan that was developed, as well as a online portal to collect outcomes in regards to um, uh, immune globulin as other blood products. So the utilization ma management framework in British Columbia, again, I think is unique where health authorities each have a utilization management coordinator that is funded by the Provincial Blood Coordinating Office. And this role comes with shared accountability in terms of, again, making sure that the um, immune globulin recommendations are occurring um, you know, in a harmonized fashion across the province, and also making sure that the data gets entered appropriately into the blood product request portal so we have the data to act on in the future. Again, these utilization management coordinators review uh, orders, adjust the dose based on the body weight, and, and then forwards the off-label or potentially inappropriate usage uh, to the transfusion medicine physicians at the respective health authorities for screening, review, and follow-up. Our specialty physician panels for rheumatology and neurology co-manage uh, co uh, patients that are referred to them for uh, maybe borderline uh, indications for which IG is approved. And so this is a PBCO coordinated and supported process. And then we also have other resources. So um, we have our own recommendations or guidelines, as well as template forms that are used for the different health authorities to try to standardize how IG is ordered and what data is collected. In British Columbia, there's also a Ministry of Health directive that is a, a set policy um, mandating that health authority transfusion medicine services um, uh, are, are tasked with the safeguarding of IG utilization management. And then, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Blood Product Request Portal is an online application that um, IG utilization management coordinators are entering the data so we can have better data collection to inform our future initiatives. So with uh, primary immunodeficiency, this accounts for about 50% of our usage. And this is uh, just a, uh, this work was led by Dr. Doug Morrison and uh, Dr. Karen Dallas uh, with a large team of immunologists. And one of the things that uh, was observed from pulling the data, as mentioned before, from our, um, our data repository is it was found that patients with more experience in terms of ordering immune globulin for primary immunodeficiency um, generally had less variation in in terms of their overall dosing use compared to patients with less uh, experience. And this is probably intuitive of one, when one thinks about it, but uh, this led the primary immune deficiency group to, uh, to, be developed, to be set up and also to try to come up with harmonized or, uh, recommendations in terms of using Ig for primary immune deficiency, recognizing also that there's no alternative to immune globulin in these types of conditions. So one can find us now as a web app um, uh, with the dose calculator and also the dosing recommendations as well as sort of diagnostic, um, uh, 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 diagnostic approaches. 
For secondary immunodeficiency, that is immune deficiency that has occurred that occurs from a from an uh, from another diagnosis. Again, previously these were uh, automatically approved, but um, the evidence base is pretty has been pretty um, uh, well described in terms of just differentiating between low immune globulins and actual immune deficiency in terms of having a history of infections. And the evidence base is quite poor for long-term benefit, uh, even when it comes to quality of life outcomes. So uh, there was another specialist working group that was developed to develop evidence-based prerequisites uh, that are pretty similar to what the Australians use. And that tends to be, uh, that tends to be one of the high bars uh, that is used worldwide in terms of adjudicating um, immune globulin for secondary immune deficiency. And one of our um, um, big takeaways from this is that uh, for patients who are prescribed Ig, maybe even appropriately to start, there is a chance for to reconnect them with immunologists or expert review, and then also to try to have a drug holiday to see if patients can come off of the Ig long term. Uh, so this is something that just rolled out at the beginning of this year, and we're uh, starting to follow the different health authorities to see how this has been implemented. As mentioned before, we have our uh, expert panels, the neurology screening panel. Um, uh, neurology represents the highest Ig usage outside of immune replacement as an immunomodulator. We have a core panel um, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Katie Beaton, Christine Chapman, and uh, Nadim Jiwa. And one of the exciting things I'm, I'm happy to announce is we've now added central nervous system conditions and also new panel members who have expertise in those uh, conditions. And um, uh, new guidelines have been released with this that are the first worldwide. For the rheumatology panel, we have such a, a first such panel to be created uh, uh, in Canada. Again, the core panel is uh, Ken Blocka, John Kelso, and Cam Shojania. And um, one of the unique aspects of this type of rheumatology screening is that rheumatology, the rheumatology clinics associated with these doctors um, also have uh, better access to pharmaceutical immunomodulators. So these clinics we think are a model of how Ig can be rationalized along with other pharmaceutical immunomodulators uh, for best patient care rather than what is easy to access. Finally, for immune globulin, uh, we've also um, overhauled our guidelines for subcutaneous immune globulin programs in Canada. So previously, um, all health authorities were supposed to have a home infusion program, but uh, not this, this did not occur throughout all different health authorities, um, including the health authority that I work for at Vancouver Coastal. We don't have a, and therefore we didn't have a universal approach. Um, industry third-party support programs uh, were also in place that um, were uh, uh, appropriately implemented, but we're also uh, potentially training, uh, inadvertently training patients um, that may have had, had bypassed approval from blood banks, largely because clinicians were filling out these forms and directing them to the third-party support programs, not realizing that they involved blood banks. So some of the goals of our state guidelines was not to uh, inform what the dosing should be, but really to harmonize the processes from the different health authorities. That is, if you get prescribed uh, subcutaneous immune globulin in one health authority versus the other, our belief is that that, that process should be seamless uh, and also seamless if one picks up from one health authority to another. Uh, we also are advocating for health authority programs to uh, exist alongside the industry third-party support programs, and also in collaboration directly with these third-party support programs, outlining uh, the processes in which uh, they collaborate with the healthcare system, and also um, working with the third-party support programs for opportunities for remote and rural outreach. So, because many of these programs have better uh, ability to outreach to these rural and remote uh, programs, and also has some success reaching out to Indigenous communities as well. So that was a lot on immune globulin utilization management. And so why we're doing this um, is because we believe that pro plasma protein products in general are a finite resource where immune globulin tends to be the largest amount. There's no alternatives in immune replacement. And we just want to ensure that there's appropriate return on investment, not just reducing uh, the amount of Ig used. So our future challenges is that we uh, we want to better look at our program effectiveness versus efficacy, and also because the blood system and the health authority or health jurisdiction systems tend to be separate, um, you know, uh, separately funded. Um, we find that uh, at health authorities, there's little, maybe less incentive to be stewards uh, of blood. So how do we at the Provincial Blood Coring Office support stewards and promote the best therapies in these BC health authorities? 
Next topic I'll go over is about inherited bleeding disorders. Again, very basic. Um, I think uh, for many of you in this audience will already know this, but the main inherited bleeding disorders we tend to see are a lack of factor eight and factor nine. And the as one can imagine, if one has a loss of these factors due to uh, in, inherited disease, um, this leads to repeated severe bleeding, which has um, not only uh, severe morbidity to these patients, but also severe, uh, also uh, increases their chance of mortality. Traditionally, this has been historically replaced uh, by treated by replacing clotting factors, but this was also part of the one of the big issues in the tainted blood sca scandal. So, um, traceability in terms of um, sourcing um, the factor products as well as figuring out which patients they are going to, uh, in terms of that traceability, is a cornerstone of maintaining safety. And previously, uh, this was, uh, again, before my time, but before, um, uh, previously, there was a sort of a mix of different information systems that were sort of brought together to try to track where product came from, which hospitals they ended up at, and then eventually which patients they were infused in. And as one can imagine, with all these different disjointed systems, um, there was not a really great way to sort of really trace both safety and appropriateness from vein to vein. And you also had home utilization records that tended to just exist on paper and were not well, not also not well described, but had no way to get to hospitals and health authorities appropriately for us to um, sort of collate this data to figure out how this product was, how these factor products were being used. And this is what led to the development of iChip. There are some uh, simu similar um, uh, systems that exist throughout Canada, but iChip is sort of BC homegrown with both a clinical module and a patient home module. So the clinical module being being an ability, having the ability to uh, assess what treatment protocols patients are on and what their utilization is. And then the patient home module is a way to for patients to self-record what uh, has been infused uh, so they can, uh, so again, we can have that vein to vein traceability and have a sense of uh, factor product utilization. And it's important that in these patient, um, these patient populations that they're increasingly complex and improving care. So um, with both hemophilia A and B, which are uh, the inherited deficiencies of factor eight and factor nine, uh, we've gone from using just purely plasma-derived products to viral inactivated products to, um, you know, long half-life products and monoclonal antibodies. And because the therapies are getting more and more complex um, and also more effective, as we see now with a new therapy called emesuzumab, um, really being a game changer in ter terms of reducing bleeds and reducing hospital days in, in patients that we've observed in British Columbia, where we borrow this data from Dr. Shannon Jackson at the, um, at the hemophilia clinic. Uh, because many of these therapies still exist with the blood system, we believe by tracking its usage um, and determining what patients they go to, as well as tracking their outcomes, we can build a better use case for these patients to be further funded and for, uh, ex uh, for funding to expand in these uh, patient scenarios. Uh, so again, patients can get the best therapy possible uh, you know, within the constraints of our system. So for iChip, um, you know, some of the benefits is that really it exceeds uh, typical privacy and security requirements. It's also, um, you know, uh, ready to be localized in many, uh, it, to be localized in different languages. But really, some of the long-term aspects we are thinking about are whether or not we can scale it to other home infusion products for traceability, such as um, C1 esterase inhibitor or subcutaneous immune globulin. Um, if we have real-time data linkages, whether or not we can use this data to better forecast um, what, how much product uh, should be available for these inherited bleeding disorders patients and which, um, where these products should be located for best patient access. And hopefully with better connections to ele other electronic platforms like electronic medical records, uh, could we have better linkages to health authority systems? And then with that linkage, what can we learn from these linkages to other systems in terms of better delivering uh, better patient care? So with utilization management, again, I've mostly focused here on the inherited bleeding disorders and uh, the, also the red cell disorders are part of the program. Um, but really some of the challenges we have here is that these are diff, you know, difficult to manage patients 
usually by niche specialists. Um, uh, uh, and, and then also with iChip, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, it, it's a mechanism to ensure traceability, tracking, and forecasting for other home infusion therapies or patients with other complex treatment plans. Some of our future challenges that we're thinking about is how do we better support patients outside of the lower mainland or, again, more rural remote uh, trans uh, communities, also in concert with transfusion medicine services. So we're, we're, again, harmonizing our practice together. And then how do we better integrate with new clinical facing systems and electronic medical records in a new era? Because recognizing uh, much of BC and much of Canada is starting to move to new electronic um, medical records and computer provider order entry. The next part I'll briefly go to um, is, is in, in terms of clinical practice. And this leads us to, again, a unique aspect of practice here in British Columbia called the uh, British, uh, the BC Transfusion Medicine Advisory Group. This started as an advisory body, again, to the Ministry of Health on blood-related issues, including recipient notification. Um, it was instrumental in fostering collaboration, and I could go through all its own initiatives in a separate talk, but really, I think one of the unique aspects here is that all BC health authorities are represented, along with analogous technical body, a technical body, and a transfusing nursing leadership body that also collaborate with TMAG. Um, I'll just highlight some of the recent team ag collaborative initiatives where we've collaborated with BC um, Emergency Health Services to help set up a, a provincial pre-hospital transfusion program. We've collaborated with uh, Health Emergency Management BC for a critical supplies list in case the earthquake ever uh, does, does happen here in British Columbia. Uh, we're working together with a specialist trauma advisory network of BC and perinatal services BC to try to come up with um, uh, harmonized recommendations for rec massive hemorrhage. And then also in collaboration with the University of Toronto, we now have a transfusion curriculum for nurse practitioners to support a non-core competency for these, uh, for these practitioners to support uh, some inpatient wards and also uh, some uh, rural and remote settings. Also, um, in one of the technical, one of the, uh, you know, big technical initiatives that was part of sort of TMAG and the Provincial Blood Coordinating Office was to uh, establish a red blood cell redistribution program, which takes um, hospitals that have, or, or smaller hospitals that require blood from time to time, keeps them stocked and allows them to redistribute to larger hospitals that can use that blood. This is a way to reduce the uh, amount of unnecessary expired blood. And uh, this is just to say this has uh, had a great um, success that we've, we've seen over time and also uh, are starting to experiment with uh, intra-health authority uh, redistribution as well, uh, which we're seeing in, in different, different areas. Um, other other uh, clinical guides are being uh, focused on. So one of the big fo uh, focuses is on transfusion reactions. Um, so this is work chaired by by Crystal Brunk and Dr. Matthew Yan, um, uh, who, who uh, and also other folks, including Claire O'Reilly, who are looking to try to harmonize um, practices that are occurring in the different health authorities, um, as well as. Uh, now we have a harmonized provincial form for transfusion reaction to the PBCO, uh, where we hold that and send that data to the Public Health Agency of Canada. This harmonized form may now set up the possibility for electronic entry in the future. Also, with the nursing and technical resource groups, uh, we we now have there's now a learning hub of, for uh, safe transfusion practice that allows for competency in transfusion uh, uh, to develop and maintain transfusion competencies for nursing practicing. Uh, in uh, health authorities, and then also uh, better um, uh, or improve recommendations around learning and management tools for, again, adverse transfusion reactions, both on the nursing and the technical side. So this is just, that was just a very small snapshot of some of the clinical practice documents. You know, there's a whole medical policy manual that has been developed by PBCO as other guidelines and recommendations. But really, why is that? Uh, why PBCL also not only focuses on utilization management, but appropriate clinical practice? Is we think from a safety perspective, hemovigilance is key, and then also provincial practice should be harmonized as we also collaborate with the rest of the country in terms of harmonizing our national practice. Um, some of our future challenges is how do we support reporting of all adverse re reactions and collect this data and analyze it to make future safety recommendations. How do we create and maintain resources? And then how do we engage and advocate with the right stakeholders in collaboration with the blood system? Finally, I'll, I'll 
just jump into continuous quality improvement. And again, there are many quality improvement projects that are occurring at the PBCO and have occurred at the PBCO, but all largely focus on two uh, relating to applications that uh, exist within the PBCO. So with contingency planning, uh, one can uh, understand that blood shortages or threats to blood supply are a huge concern for patient care. This did occur during COVID-19 where even though there was decreased blood utilization, uh, in many cases, there was also a threat to uh, donor supply as well. So uh, with the Provincial Blood Coordinating Office, um, uh, you know, a few of the initiatives that came out were, were largely, um, you know, developing materials to support people during pandemics uh, to try to um, curtail some of the, uh, again, to, to promote best practice in terms of transfusion. Um, so there's not an inappropriate threat to the blood supply. And then also with our own data, we noted that um, in many uh, health authorities and health jurisdictions were canceling surgeries, thinking that it would reduce utilization, but also wanted to make the point that, especially for platelets, which are the most labile of the blood components, that most of, that, uh, most of the platelet usage that we saw was in non-surgical settings. So recognizing that if we were canceling surgeries throughout BC, that would not necessarily stop um, or that would not curtail all the usage of platelets in British Columbia, and that we also needed to double our focus on uh, routinely transfused patients for platelets and also prophylactic transfused uh, patients uh, for platelets. Also, uh, many of you may recognize that we had a recent snowstorm in British Columbia just this past December. We, nationally, we actually called a amber phase advisory, which was sort of a, the second highest alert phase for, for blood shortages uh, for the first time in national history. And uh, this allowed us to um, uh, dust off uh, our toolkit for the blood contingency plan that was actually thankfully uh, revised during COVID, uh, mostly led by Dr. Robert Copeland, who, who used to be the, one of the PBCO directors here. And this allowed us to um, get um, uh, provincial stakeholders to help transport blood where it was needed, but also have a connected plan between the different health authorities to try to screen and conserve blood and also transport blood to other jurisdictions where it was needed. Uh, one of the unique aspects and uh, um, credit here really goes to, to uh, Dr. Doug Morrison for developing this, uh, really being responsible for the formation of this application called the Transparent Blood Inventory, which takes inventory from the different lab information systems uh, uh, across uh, British Columbia and linking it within our databases to produce dashboards. Uh, this is the older version of the app, but the newer version of the app is, is due to come to also include um, other blood components and products as well. And the intention of this is that um, if we have an awareness of what the blood uh, supply is in different areas, that allows conversations to happen in times of isolated blood shortages, whether or not uh, blood could be supplied from one more area to the other to, to support um, short-term stop gas in these, um, in these areas. So um, why is this important? We, uh, we are starting to see that blood shortages are, or blood threats to the blood supply are increasingly common with, with uh, further strain on donor populations. Um, and oftentimes during contingency uh, or in times of crisis, there's oftentimes varied expertise that's reliant on informal connections. And this is to say um, we are to act in a national, as part of the national shortages plan set up by the National Advisory Committee for Blood and Blood Products, there's a National Emergency Blood Management Committee, which transmits um, its, uh, you know, uh, uh, shortage phase to each of the provinces, which connects to our Blood Management Committee, as well as our Transfusion Medicine Advisory Group, which is supposed to trickle down to each of the health authorities and hospitals. And as one can imagine, this cascade of information is a challenging thing to, uh, to implement. So I think our overall challenge is how do we support this structure here in British Columbia? in terms of also supporting manage, inventory management and recommendations. How do we formal, better formalize emergency responses and maintain the relevancy of these responses? Um, so they're not just varied on individual expertise. And also how do we act in concert with all of Canada to ensure that if there is a shortage that all the, uh, that we, we in British Columbia are acting along with the rest of Canada in a fair, fair manner. Finally, I'll point out for the Central Transfusion Registry, this is again quite unique to British Columbia where it collects 
um, um, blood disposition data and has done so for the last 20 plus years and has a surprising amount of records of transfusion for both blood and blood products. And um, therefore, uh, you know, where it has ended up in, in terms of recipients. And to our knowledge, this is the largest registry uh, throughout Canada. And this data has been used in a lot of different ways uh, previously where um, the transfusion registry um, acts within a data warehouse to try to connect a lot of uh, not only blood disposition data to other important sources. So this was um, this data was used to develop the uh, to share data with Canadian blood services in terms of developing the transparent blood inventory linkages to other registries allowed for us to connect blood utilization to patient outcomes. Um, I chip to uh, um, inherit bleeding disorders and other home infusion products potentially in the future. We also uh, um, in the past have reflected this data back to the health authorities for benchmarking for um, uh, in terms of our end of year presentation for ad hoc data requests to support health authorities and also for look back trace back uh, with Canadian blood services. And we hope uh, one of the immediate short-term projects is we hope to leverage this internal data for better inventory management. Again, this is um, uh, an interim process building on work that has already been done in the past. So um, previously, the Provincial Blood Coordinating Office, uh, Fraser Health and Northern Health, uh, collaborated with the UBC Solder School of Business and their Center of Operations Excellence to try to improve inventory management to reduce uh, red blood cell outdating and also minimize the amount of shortages. One of the considerations that we've had recently is to further readdress this um, in collaboration with Simon Fraser University um, and the PHSA analytics to look at um, how um, you know, to first look at a qualitative model on how technologists and other blood and blood bank staff uh, approach inventory management and also seeing whether or not we can use that data to inform um, uh, simulation modeling to, uh, to come up with best practice recommendations or, or general guides for how inventory should be managed, especially focusing on O negative red blood cells, because that tends to be the rarest and um, uh, one of the more uh, precious sources, uh, precious uses, uh, usages of blood. So um, we, uh, with our data-driven learning and practice, uh, we want to uh, find opportunities to feed back practice to uh, different stakeholders and also to learn from that practice. So some of our future challenges will be, how do we take health authority data and reflect it in a relevant and timely manner? How do we learn about it internally, about improving our own practice with our data? And then how do we share this data for QI and research collaboratively with other jurisdictions? Um, and organizations responsibly. With that, um, I'll finish my talk to say that again, I'd just like to remind people that transfusion medicine needs to be process driven to ensure safety and appropriateness. Um, and it really, transfusion medicine as a field needs to engage systems, technology, and clinical stakeholders to leverage best practice for patients and providers. And my belief, um, as shared by, many, by, by us and uh, the rest of us here at PBCOs, I think we have a role to be the provincial connective tissue in these um, uh, goals to support BC Health Systems goals. And again, that's to really promote and facilitate the delivery of safe, appropriate, standardized, and sustainable use of blood products, as well as our alternatives throughout BC. With that, I'm happy to take questions, but also just wanted to highlight that there are a lot, there's a giant team uh, within PBCO and Provincial Lab Medical Services that supports the work and has done so for the last 20 years or so. And finally, the, the last uh, shout out I'll have is for uh, Amy Beauchamp, who is, uh, um, uh, has been with the PBCO, my understanding, since day one, and really has been the continuing heart of, of, of the Provincial Blood Inquiry Office and uh, a lot of the initiatives that have gone through and how it has both served a future looking view and also has the past to draw upon in terms of where the PVCO should go. And a lot of times uh, I, I always feel that Amy Beauchamp is our sort of unofficial leader at the Provincial Blood Coordinating Office. So uh, just wanted to uh, have that shout out for her. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions from the group. Thanks, Andrew. That was fabulous. Uh, um, an incredibly complex and uh, 
overwhelming um, job you have there um, and amidst all the other things that you do. Uh, um, I'll open it up to questions. Cedric, you're it's moving. Andrew? Ken, okay, fine. So <clears throat> time expired, me, not blood. Uh, but uh, I know when I was working at BGH, one of the issues was the cost of pharmaceutical products. And they had a series of very gifted D farms. And every time something came along, they did a very detailed uh, analysis of cost effectiveness, et cetera. This wasn't really happening in transfusion medicine. Uh, because there wasn't a perceived cost to the hospital of the product. Uh, you seem to have really sort of grasped the nettle uh, and uh, introduced this, although I still suspect that the hospital system still has no concept of the cost of blood products. Uh, in, in short, Cedric, you are 100% correct about this. I mean, to give you a perspective, even from uh, my practice setting at Vancouver General Hospital, um, typically, even if a blood products or, or blood components are used, um, the hospital doesn't see that cost or is not even aware of that cost. So sometimes it is very difficult to have conversations about stewardship uh, with the hospital. I think the positive things that we have going for this, though, is, is a couple fold. I think one, a lot of times people do, even outside of costs, um, recognize that alternatives to blood oftentimes lead to better patient outcomes. So I think framing it in terms of better patient outcomes, lower length of hospital stay, lower cost of having staff to need to transfuse blood and blood products, I think is, is, is one way that, you know, areas like patient blood management have managed to find success. Um, there is overall a uh, recognition that blood and blood products and pharmaceutical products that they eventually can't come up from the same budget. So I think compared to historical situations, I think people are much more willing and open to have that conversation. Um, here in British Columbia, my understanding is that um, the blood portfolio and the pharmaceutical portfolio is now under the same umbrella, at least in the Ministry of Health. So again, there's a recognition that at least the two areas can have conversations about rationally what is the best product for the for the right patient. Um, but you're right, Cedric, it is still a continuing challenge about trying to find pharmaceutical alternatives. And understandably that uh, in limited healthcare budgets, people are oftentimes looking at their own silo uh, rather than thinking about the, the whole because they, they have to be concerned about their own backyard first. So I think that's a, that's a very nuanced discussion to have and still continues to happen. Uh, there's a question by from Sheila Harding. Sheila, are you there? I am just finding the mute button. Um, thanks so much, Andrew. I'm curious in your list of your village, you have some in italics and some not. Does that connote who gets paid by whom? Who's, <laughs> who's core and who's affiliate? Yeah, I, I wasn't sure how to denote this, but this, you know, the uh, folks in italics tend to be sort of uh, people who have leadership roles within these organizations. So okay. um, that's that's the only thing I wanted to highlight with, uh, with those italics. Oh, okay. As you know, we'd be happy to replicate many of these roles in our shop. <laughs> and also, I just wanted to call out, Sheila, that um, I think the Prairie... Uh, IG guidelines are, in my opinion, actually, I think the most well, do well done in the country. So I uh, personally believe that uh, rather than reinventing the wheel in every single jurisdiction, we should, we can probably do better to support each other in terms of sharing resources. And um, in, in, in some fashion, I suppose, if we can help at the PVCO, you know, we mm -hmm. would also love to learn from you folks over at SAS Blood. Well, th thank you much. And uh, you have enough people in BC to have your specialty panels to adjudicate uh, requests. Uh, our, one of our challenges is that we sometimes have an N of one specialist um, and we would benefit from cross provincial panels if such a discussion ever came to fruition. Uh, Andrew, actually, on that note, um, these panels are these these advise these are advisory panels. Are they are are they decision making panels, and um, they're clearly not blinded in in the sense because they are local. Um, does that create problems um, for access and favoritism and all those other issues? 
Yeah, no, I think that's a very fair question, Ed. Um, and, and and this is to say, again, I, I have a shorter history with the PPCO than, than many folks. But I will say, um, first of all, the PPCO panels are uh, manage uh, uh, IG. So they do have the capability of, in a way, saying yes or no, uh, based off of the Ministry of Health directives. Um, the other aspect is, you know, is there is there potential favoritism? Uh, potentially, but I think one of the benefits of, or at least my observation of the PVCO panels is they also tend to pick from uh, places that also uh, represent other jurisdictions, especially now in the neurology panel, we've, we represented some folks, uh, different folks from the CNS panel as well. Uh, so hopefully that mitigates some of the bias as well. But um, really, this was a way to connect especially patients um, that were not being managed in the community by non-specialty physicians to try to reconnect them back to specialty physician care. Um, so I, I would probably say, you know, hopefully the, the, the bias is relatively minimal. So just from a practical point of view, so a physician in, in remote BC who decides to order IG, IVIG for a patient, so that physician must have permission to, to use it or um, is advised or who has the final authority and say um, on the decision to use that um, drug effectively? Yeah, totally. Uh, so it works differently with the different panels. So with the rheumatology panel, um, they are on call during the daytime. So they will immediately adjudicate uh, to determine whether or not IG is appropriate or not. And then we'll relay their recommendation back to the ordering clinician as well as the transfusion service. With the neurology panel, there is a recognition that sometimes diagnostics takes a little bit of time to get back. And also you're trying to as get assessment of whether or not IG is even producing a response. So uh, usually in that case, um, treatments uh, occur are allowed for the first sort of three cycles um, that, that are, that, can be given for one of these so-called conditionally approved cases. And then after that, uh, it is referred to the PBCL neurology panel for them to review whether or not continued uh, IG is appropriate. Uh, any explanation, it's been long known that Canada uses more IVIG than pretty well everywhere else in the, in the world. Why is that? Um, I think, it's hard to know for sure, Ed. I mean, one of my, I mean, so first of all, you are seeing increasing usage worldwide. I do think in Canada, uh, at least compared to, I, I think the separate bu blood budget may be potentially a little bit of an issue. So I think about IG being treated as a pharmaceutical product in the United States, right? If you're looking at IG as a pharmaceutical product compared to other pharmaceutical products, I think then as Cedric sort of inferred, you can have that more head-to-head -head comparison in terms of cost effectiveness and uh, patient outcomes. I think, I do truly believe that the siloing of these two different therapeutic uh, scenarios uh, means that because IG tends to be a little bit easier to access compared to pharmacy, um, you know, it tends to get used more often. And in many cases, it's appropriate, and in some cases, it's not. Okay. Uh, Ed Prysdale, are you on there? Is that you? Are that's you asking me. a question or are you just showing your face? Well, that's, I guess both. Uh, I wanted to point out that Mark Villatrudi has a question. So maybe, Mark, you want to unmute and ask your question before I do. Oh, thanks. I, I think, Andrew, I think we're going to need to sit down and have a good discussion about integration. Um, Cerner's his own beast. I have my doubts, but that's just my opinion. But with the new Canadian Bleeding Disorders Registry being uh, upgraded, I think there's opportunity there with, with uh, I guess, the next generation of iChip or how it evolves in its future future state. But that's something we can do with one minute past the uh, hour that we were allotted. Yeah, completely and, agree, Mark. Yeah. And my question is really a continuation of Mark's, and and that is. Um, uh, with Sheila on board here as well. Uh, um, why why do we have a pro provincial blood coordinating office? Why don't we have a national blood coordinating office? I guess we kind of do, but this these questions are in every single province. They're the same in every single province. Perhaps the solution might not be I, absolutely identical. But certainly addressing these questions needs to be the same in everyone. Let's, 
maybe we do need to coordinate like Mark was saying, and maybe iChip needs could be the platform to do that, or at least be the beginning of, of unifying. Yeah, no, I think that's a very fair question or a very fair comment, Ed. Um, you know, and I, I don't know, uh, you know, I think largely some of that is from the history of how things are funded, but I do see that different jurisdictions are more um, willing and able to collaborate. And I do think the National Advisory Committee for Blood and Blood Products is, is again, if you have PBCO connecting different health authorities, I do think NAC has some potential ability to connect uh, stakeholders at the national level to, to agree on practice. So um, definitely, I think things are, the needle's moving in the right direction, in my opinion. Thanks, Andrew. Nice to see you, long distance at least. Yeah. So with that, thanks very much, Andrew. Any group that can bring health authorities together is um, really a, an, an amazing feat. Um, and uh, thanks for very much for elucidating the role of the PPCO and, uh, and all that you've done. Um, and we look forward to hearing more great gains as you enter deeper into this job. So thanks um, on behalf of everybody. I'll just take this a second just to remind everybody that the um, um, the summer studentship program is is going to be very active and the deadline for applications is March the March the 8th March the 10th so please um, you know if you know summer students are anxious to have a great experience in the labs this or labs or clinics um, this uh, coming summer um, get your applications in they're on the um, CBR website. Um, and um, that's it. So have a great day, have a great week, everybody. There's food at the back if you happen to be here. All right, thanks again, Andrew.